Hello, I'm the Dark Master, and welcome back to the History of Elephants. In this episode, we'll be going over the Clyde Elephantida and the families within. <laughs> Elephantida is the other half of the Elephantomorva. We discussed the Mastodon today, last time. They were the other half. There are four groups in this group. Colorolophodontidae, Embilodontidae, Gompotheridae, and Elephantoidae. Let's start with Colorolophodontidae. The first family... Corlophodon today used to be considered part of the Gompotheres. We'll get to that group in a bit. However, it was determined that they were more primitive than the other Gompotheres. There were two genera which lived in the Miocene from 17 to 7 million years ago. The species Afrocoodon is known from little more than teeth, so the focus shall be on Corlophodon. Corlophodon lived during the Miocene in Eurasia. Fossils have been found in Southeast Europe, Iraq, Iran, the Indian subcontinent, and China. It was a smaller proboscidean with very low and flat skulls. The small lower tusks are believed to have been a divergent, but otherwise the genera might represent the ancestral form of the Elephantida. Now let's go over the Ambelodonts, which are slightly more well known. The Ambelodontidae were also considered to be Gompotheres, but are now considered a distinct, more primitive family. They are mostly distinguished by their fact that the lower pair of tusks were flattened like shovels, while gompotheres retained the more tusk-like shaped, well, tusks. General of this included the quote-unquote shovel tuskers, Ambelodon, Archibelodon, Conobelodon, Platybelodon, Cerbelodon, Torinobelodon, and Progompotherium. No, Progompotherium wasn't a gompotherium. M. Belladon, for whom the family is named, was a genus of two species that lived from the middle to late Miocene, about 9 million to 5 million years ago. The species M. Belladon, Floridius, was the older species, a little smaller than modern elephants. The next species was larger, M. Belladon Ferrici. Two other species were moved to another genus. That newly formed genus was Conobelladon which was found in China and lived alongside the obscure genus Toribelodon and Progopotherium. Now, as we go over the last three species, I'll discuss what this group was really like and dispel some misconceptions that they have. Those, like Platybelodon, were believed to have used their lower tusks, similar to shovels, to sort of shovel up ve swampy vegetation from wet areas of grassy savanna. They were also thought to have had a flap-like trunk. However, these beliefs have been challenged. Wear patterns from the teeth of Archibelodon, a genus which was the ancestor of Platybelodon and Archibelodon, who lived 16.9 to 16 million years ago in Europe and North Africa, indicate that Ambelodonts in general use their tusks to strip bark from trees similar to modern-day elephants, or scythes, if some people would describe them as. Also, the trunks were likely long, similar to modern elephants, although due to a lack of soft tissue, this cannot be confirmed 100%. Cerebellodon, along with being one of the more obscure genera of embellodont, died out 
2.5 million years ago in the Pliocene. The cause of their extinction is believed to be changes in climate and competition with a third slash fourth, depending on how you define it, wave of elephant diversification, which also competed with the Gompatheres, which survived much longer, as we'll explain in a bit. As a group, Gompatheres have had a complex history, first erected by the German zoologist Karl Hermann Konrad Burmeister. It was p discovered basically to be a paraphyletic waste basket taxon with many unrelated lineages. It was originally classified into four subfamilies. Of these two were found to be separate families that I discussed earlier, while the tetralophodont quote-unquote gompotheres were found to be in fact even more closely related to elephants and thus were another separate group, but we'll discuss them in a future episode. Eventually, it was settled by Demilia Moltfe that only the group formerly called the Trilophodont Gompatheres form a natural group, and from this is where we can call the family Gompatheres. There has been some shaky up with regards to the South American genera, but we'll go over the problems with that branch of the Gompathere family tree. Now, however, let's go over the group that gave the family its name, the Gompatherium. Gompatherium, the welded beast, was a very long-lasting genus, surviving from the early Miocene to the early Pleistocene. It spread all across Eurasia, Africa, and North America. The species Gompatherium productium was 8 feet 3 inches tall and weighed 4.6 tons, with an even larger species, Gompatherium stain helmensi, which was 10.4 feet tall and 6.7 tons. I must state that the sheer success and long longevity of this genus is pretty much unchallenged in the mammal record. No other large mammal has so far lasted that long. It outlasted humans by a wide margin. The most iconic attribute is Gompatherium's four tusks, two on the upper jaw and two on the elongated lower jaw. The lower tusks were somewhat shaped like a shovel, but nowhere near to the extent that the Ambelodonts had. These tusks were covered in enamel, unlike modern elephants. This covering would lead to certain changes in future lineages, because despite living in the dry Miocene, it lived near lakes with relatively small incursions into dry wetlands. In comparison to earlier proboscideans, Gompatherium had fewer molars, but the remaining molars had higher ridges to expand the grinding surface. With regards to the enamel, enamel is not very good at conducting heat. That will become relevant in a little bit. Gompatherium was the most basal Gompatherium, from which the others diverged. Next we come to Nathobelodon, a genus endemic to North America that lived from the middle to late Miocene. It is called a spoon-billed Gompatherium, since the lower jaw was elongated and shaped like a spoon, similar to the quote-unquote shovel tuskers. However, Nathobelodon did not in fact have those lower tusks, merely having sort of a weird jaw shape, but it wasn't actually supported by tusks, so it is believed to have evolved convergently. Megabeldon was another genre of Gompatheria that lived in North America from the Miocene to the Pliocene. It is a disputed genus, some think it's a synonym for Gompatherium. It's not the only one, I can assure you. Eubelodon was another genre of Gompatheria restricted to what is now the Great Plains. Aside from the downward pointing tusks, I would like to note the decreasing size of the lower tusks. The loss of lower tusks is a recurring trend in proboscidean evolution. The last Old World Gompather, Sina Macedon, the Chinese browser, had lost its lower tusks completely. It is believed that this occurred as a trend in multiple di different lineages is because Tusks are very heat conductive, meaning they lose a large amount of 
heat, and colder climates, and only a single pair is needed for both defense and sexual activity. Thus, there is an advantage to losing the extra tusks. As we can see, in warmer climates, this change was slower, such as in Central America, though, though they were lost there as well. A similar trend occurred in the lineage that led to modern-day elephants, as well as the mastodons, as discussed earlier. Speaking of, Gompe theories died out in the old world due to another colding and drying period, which replaced the already dry forest with savanna and grassland. It was also competition from modern elephants and their very close relatives, but we'll get that in a little bit. Rhinotherium emerged in North America and spread to Central America. It is believed to have evolved from Gompotherium and lived from the Miocene to the Pliocene from 13.6 to 3.6 million years ago, living for 10 million years. It is believed Rhinotherium evolved into the last radiation of Gompotheres in Central and South America. These were the Brevostrife clade, also called the Curviernidae. The first genus, Stegomastodon, the roofed breast tooth, where stego means roof, that's why Stegosaurus means roof lizard. In appearance, it stood 8.5 feet tall with a weight of around 4.7 tons. Like modern elephants, but unlike typical gompotheres, it lost the lower two pair of tusks, which were curved greatly upwards and were as many as 11.5 feet long. Its molars were covered in enamel and had a complex pattern of ridges that enabled it to eat grass, evolving in mimicry to mammoths. It also had a relatively large brain. It lasted until just 28,000 years ago. That's not a long time in the grand scheme of things. The next non-controversial genus is Cuvierneus, named after the very famous paleontologist George Cuvier, which is considered the founding father of paleontology, and discovered the genus. Cuvierneus would have stood typically around 7.5 feet tall and weighed 3.5 tons, but its most characteristic trait were its spiral-shaped tusks that jutted outwards. This gene is probably initially evolved in North America around 5.3 to 5.2 million years ago from a population of Rhinocotherium. During the Great American Interchange around 3 million years ago, it, alongside the ancestor of the last two genus, which we'll discuss in a bit, moved south. They were the only purpose Guineans to reach South America. It arrived later, and as such, apparently had a more restricted, though it was still relatively successful, range. It survived until 13,390 years ago. Though there is evidence of them possibly surviving till 200 to 400 AD, but this is controversial. If true, they would have outlived the last of the woolly mammoths and have been the last non-true elephants to survive to the modern day. The last genus slash genera that we'll be discussing is Haplomastodon and Nodiomastodon. <laughs> For this video, I will just state that I consider them to be separate but very similar genera. Nodia Mastodon, however, will be the focus of the rest of the video. It must be stated that if you shave a lion and a tiger, they're nearly identical. And it's for that reason that I consider them separate genera. Now, there are possibilities that they are the same genera, but I'm just sticking to my opinion. But since I won't be covering Haplomastodon for the rest of this video, I hope you can understand. Nodio Mastodon was endemic to South America from the Pleistocene to the Holocene, approximately 1.2 million to 0 0.006 million years ago. It was widely distributed over most of South America, excluding the High Andes. The species is morphologically viable, and it was a very convoluted taxonomic history, the as well as a mysterious evolutionary history. Nodio Mastodon, like the other Central and South American Gompotheres within the Brevrostrine clade, also called the Cuviernidae family, had lost its lower tusks, similar to modern elephants. Unlike the other two genera, its tusks were not as sharply twisted, such as Cuviernius, or as curved upwards as Stegomastodon. It would have likely lived similar to elephants in population and behavior. It ate shrubs and grasses, as indicated by the grass residue on its teeth. The extinction of the Gompotheres can be considered an explosive end to a fading lineage. True elephants had outcompeted them in Africa, stegodons in southern Europe and Asia. 
Mammoths are competing them in northern Eurasia and even North America, the group's stronghold. While South and Central America did have climate change, it was much less and allowed them to survive for quite a while. But this stress and combined with a general shift from mixed feeding to more specialized feeding set them on a precipice. However, it was in this time of increased stress a new force arrived. The ancient ancestors of Native Americans. Da, da, da. All of this combined led to the group's extinction at a generally recognized date of 6,000 years ago. Possibly 400 AD at the latest, if an account is true. This is a great loss, and I am truly ashamed. But hey, I mean, 400... AD, that's pretty good. And so ends this episode. The fourth taxonomic family, Elephantoidae, includes the elephants and their closest extinct relatives, such as the Stegodons and Mammoth, which I've mentioned earlier. We shall discuss them next time. I'm the Dark Master, and consider subscribing for the next episode of The History of the Elephants.